Welcome to the sleep temples. Do not listen to this MP3 whilst driving or operating heavy machinery. If you are epileptic, please consult your doctor. Jonathan was a traveller. He loved to travel to exotic places and to discover what ancient civilizations did. He particularly loved Egypt. He would travel to Cairo. This was a bustling city with lots of noise and aromatic smells from spices and cooking. But there were also the not so pleasant smells from the donkeys and the camels that moved around the streets intermingling with the taxis and the buses. Jonathan always found Cairo a thriving city, but one difficult in which to fall asleep to at night. His mind would wander over a range of different things, over the past, the pharaohs and the pyramids. The noise and the smells of Cairo just seem to make this inevitable. But nothing in life is inevitable. His investigations into Egyptian culture had disclosed that the ancient Egyptians had no trouble getting to sleep at night. And in his moments of wakefulness, Jonathan would contemplate the strange and powerful knowledge of the ancient Egyptians. The pyramids were a mystery to modern man. How they were constructed and for what purpose still eludes us. With all our modern knowledge, we still have gaps. And one of those gaps is in the working of the sleep temples of ancient Egypt. These sleep temples were located down the Nile from Cairo, but located further in the desert and away from the Nile. The Nile, of course, is the most important river in Egypt. It is their lifeblood. The seasons and most of the crops are dependent on its rise and fall. Drifting down the Nile is one of the most relaxing experiences imaginable. Jonathan had many times taken a boat down the Nile as the sun set. It was such a relaxing experience that he often fell asleep. Sleep just seemed to come over him, almost without him being aware of it. That was the way of the Nile. It allowed all the cares and worries that one had just to fall into insignificance against the conjure of the Nile. It allowed all the cares and worries that one had just to fall into insignificance against the grandeur of the Nile. And so the next day, Jonathan made his way out of Cairo, heading back for the sleep temples. The only way for a traveler like him to get there was on horseback across the desert. It took about two hours in the hot sun. The journey was not at all arduous. And surprisingly, the desert had more to see than just sand. It was evening when Jonathan had arrived and he arranged to see a guide who would take him around the sleep temples the next day. They talked late into the night. The guide went off to his home and his wife and Jonathan went to his room. The guide went off to his home and his wife and Jonathan went into his room. It was very quiet and peaceful relative to Cairo and he soon drifted off into a peaceful and restful sleep, a sound and satisfying deep sleep. And in this deep sleep, he began to dream he dreamt of Menephis, the high priest of the sleep temple. Menephis was the high priest after his father and his father before him. The secrets of the sleep temple 
had been passed down from father to son. The most important secrets were the knowledge of helping people to dream. Not insignificant dreams, but dreams that allowed them to resolve their problems. This was the most significant part of the priest's work. Menefist was an expert at this. He could get people who came to the temple to dream dreams so significant and so important and so useful that they resolved many problems in just a few nights, sometimes just in one night. But for some individuals, their problems were very great. And even so, he could always help, but it just took a bit longer. The dreams had to be built up. They first resolved the lesser problems. And once they were resolved, the more significant problems could be worked on all the time. Menefis had a way to allow the person to sleep soundly and peacefully, although the night, through the night, while all this was taking place. And in this, he never failed. The secrets of the temple ensured that this was so. No one was clear what these secrets were, and some just felt that Menephis had an intimate knowledge of the workings of the unconscious mind. But whatever it was, all the people who came for help were not concerned. All they wanted was a solution to their problem. Jonathan awoke with a bang on the door and it was the guide who was to take him to the sleep temples that day. He dressed and they went down for a small breakfast and then went off to the temples. Jonathan was even wondering if his dream was a premonition or whether Menephis did exist or whether it was all a dream. Egypt had a strange effect on making dreams come true. The sleep temples, like all monuments of ancient Egypt, were strewn with hieroglyphics. Jonathan was quite an expert on Egyptian hieroglyphics. He had learned to read the hieroglyphics and studied Greek civilization because they too had sleep temples. One of the most famous was the sleep temple that was in Delphi, north of Greece. The sleep temple in Delphi was situated up on the mountain above the town and away from the shore. The oracle of Delphi was famous throughout the land. Although the sleep temples of Greece were so called they were not like the sleep temples of Egypt. They were places people went to resolve their problems. True, the sleep temples of Egypt did this too, but the Oracle of Delphi was more to do with resolving problems. The sleep that came over the individual wanting help was not a normal sleep, but a trance state that allowed them to be receptive to the Oracle's pronouncements. The temple at Delphi was located on the far side of the complex. This had developed over the years with peddlers selling their wares and trying to sell the seekers and the secret potions. Many plays were acted here as well, many of which were about the fame of the oracle. Exactly how the oracle resolved the problems was not known. Seekers came to the temple. First they had to go through some purification ceremony and then they were clothed in special robes and were garlanded in flowers and special perfume. Only then could they enter the temple. They always entered alone. Soon after entering, they would enter a sleep-like state. And when in this state, the oracle would deliver its resolution when the individual came out of the temple, they could remember nothing of what took place. It was all like a dream. 
and as if they were asleep, and all they had was vague images and impressions. But what they were certain of, and why they were certain, eluded them completely, was that they had a solution to their problem. The solution was not always something simple. Sometimes it involved them changing their lifestyle or taking responsibility for something. But whatever it was, the individual knew deep down that it was a solution, but a conditional solution. And it would only be a solution if they carried out what they were instructed to do. And this reminds me of a youth called Kalab. And Kalab had been given a special sword by his father when his father was on his deathbed. This sword, his father said, is the sword of life. But, my son, it has two sharp edges, the one of beauty and the one of ugliness. The edge of beauty moves with grace and appreciation, while the edge of ugliness cuts with ignorance and disdain. My son, you can create a situation of ugliness or you can create a situation of beauty. But you must recognize both. When you come to recognize both, you can then avoid the situation of ugliness and turn more and more to the situation of beauty. My son, he continued, only you can recognize your true nature. Only you can recognize when you turn to the side of ugliness and when you turn to the side of beauty. At this, Kalab was not sure his father's meaning. How do I know, said Kalab. My son, when you wield the sword, you will cut with only one of two sides. When you cut with the sides of ugliness, you will feel certain emotions and feelings. The type of feelings you would have if you used your sword on a deer and cut its throat. On the other hand, when you cut with the side of beauty, your soul surges in your breast. You will know from your feelings and your emotions that your deed was just. You will know instinctively which side of the sword you yielded. Learn to recognize these differences, my son. Learn to yield the sword on the side of beauty and not on the side of ugliness. His father continued, but there is more to the sword, my son. Your mind is like the sword with its two sides, the sides of ugliness and the side of beauty. When you wield the sword, the direction of the blade is being directed by your mind if your mind is filled with ugliness, then the sword will cut with the side of ugliness. When your mind is filled with beauty, then so your sword will strike with the side of beauty. So the secret, my son, is to fill your mind with beauty and banish all thoughts of ugliness. Sharpen your mind and constantly keep it under your control. Know when your thoughts are ugly and when they are beautiful. Do not wield the sword when your thoughts turn to pictures of ugliness. Learn only to wield your sword when your thoughts are pure and full of beauty. And as you turn your thoughts only to those of the highest order, so you will only wield your sword on the side of beauty. Kalab's father was almost at his last breath, but he managed to say one more thing. As you keep your mind sharp and in your control, so Kalab, you will keep the side of beauty of the sword sharp and in your control. So Kalab, you will keep the side of beauty of the sword sharp and you will learn only to wield the sword on the side of beauty. And so he died. Kalab sat there, looking at his dead father, and pondering all that he had been told. 
realizing that the mind controls the body and the emotions. To wield the sword on its side of beauty, he will need to sharpen his mind and keep it within his control. And in so doing, when he wields the sword, it will strike with the side of beauty and not ignorance. And so Kalab thanked his father as he buried him in the family grave. And so the seekers of the oracle at Delphi often could not remember what they were instructed to do since this was given to them while they were in a sleep-like state. But their unconscious knew what it was and so long as their unconscious was prepared to take on board the oracle's instructions then a resolution to their problem was certain. And this is why the oracle had such good success. People clearly wanted a resolution to their problem, both consciously and unconsciously. Who wants to carry a burden around for long periods of time? Who wants to make life so depressing for themselves? No. People want to be unburdened. People do not want to be depressed. On the contrary, people want to be happy and want to live life to the full. And so it was that the sleep temple at Delphi came to be known far and wide, but it was not about sleep as such, not like the knowledge of the sleep temples in ancient Egypt, as shown by the hieroglyphics on the walls. And as Jonathan studied the hieroglyphics, he came to understand at some level what the sleep temples of Egypt were all about. Sleep was disturbed when the individuals worried and placed excessive burdens on themselves. As these burdens mounted, they became like mountains of pressure in which there seemed no relief. All problems became big problems to them. All concerns were big concerns. Each day became more and more difficult and the aim of the sleep temples was to bring perspective to the individual. They were asked to consider the worst thing that could possibly happen to them. And having thought about this, they were to consider getting through this event or situation. They were shown that they had the resources within themselves to do this. It was they who resolved the most difficult thing that could happen to them. The solution did not come from the outside, but from the inside from their own resources. What they were shown, really, was that they had the resources within themselves far greater than they realized, and that if they could resolve the most difficult thing that could happen to them, they could draw on the same internal resources that they used for the biggest problems of all. But that was only part of the solution provided by the sleep temples. They taught people to see the bedroom as a place to sleep in just the same way as a garage is a place to put the car when finished for the day. So is the bedroom and the bed was a place for sleep. Not a place to brood or worry, not a place to exercise in, but a place to shut down for the night and allow the body to recuperate through the night. The priests pointed out the need for the body to rest each night so that a new day could be faced with a clear head and restored energy. Above all, they emphasized constant relaxation, not just when going to bed at night, but at all times. And as Jonathan was reading this from the hieroglyphics, to his amazement, he found that the main priest who expounded this was Menephis. It appeared that Menephis had discovered that calm relaxation was not a luxury, but a necessity. That over the years, man had become so preoccupied with challenges, with work, with wars, with constant development, that they had lost the most fundamental body need of all, a need to relax. Menephis knew that when the body was calm and relaxed, 
the mind and body acting as one. When an individual was synchronized in mind and body, sleep came much more easily. It was also a deep, satisfying sleep. A sleep that allowed a person to dream as they were meant to dream. It appeared that Menephis had come to appreciate one of life's mysteries. And like many mysteries, the idea was simple. But so simple, it had been missed. Like looking for something and you don't see it. You don't see it because it's right in front of you. And so individuals who came to the sleep temples were taught to relax. To relax throughout the day and to remain calm in all circumstances. To realize that objects cannot make them tense. They can only do this to themselves. Situations that happen cannot make them tense. They can only do this to themselves. Even people cannot make them tense. Only they can do this to themselves. Menephis taught the seekers to the temple not to be so hard on themselves. That they deserve better and it was within their own behaviour that they could make it better, could make it so, and those who left the temple resolving to do this improved. But others did not heed the words of Menephis. They considered it all too easy. They wanted a complex solution to their problem. Jonathan thought about what he had learnt from the hieroglyphics and resolved himself not to make the same mistake. That he too would now learn to relax and remain calm and to do so each hour of the day. And that night, Jonathan went to sleep easily and quickly and drifted into a deep and restful sleep.